I'd like to introduce our expert panelists today, Emil Olkers, Associate Director at Supply Chain Partner, as well as Vidya McLeod, Customer Solution Partner at Cooper. Uh, Emil and Vidya, would you take a moment to introduce yourselves, give us some background info on yourselves, and of course, uh, Vidya, ladies first. Sure. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to do this webinar with you to talk about Kuba implementations. As you mentioned before, I'm a customer solution partner here at Kuba. What that technically means is I'm responsible for sort of putting together such implementation plans that our customers see for the very first time, our prospects see for the very first time. I work with partners such as yourself in making sure that the plan that you present to the customer has appropriate things involved. Been at Cooper for just over a year now, but I've been doing sourcing and procurement for 23 years. A huge amount of that was spent doing Cooper implementations. So it's great to come here and talk about some of those experiences as well. Uh, wonderful video. Thank you so much for taking time and joining us. Really appreciate it. Uh, Emil. Hey, Ren. Yeah, so my name is Emil. Um, I look after ACP's Kuba practice for the EMEA region, so Middle East, Europe, and, and Africa. Um, I've been with ACP for five years now, started off with um, doing the actual implementations and, and uh, recently started looking after the, the Kuba practice. Before that, I've spent about 17 years doing procurement analytics and then together with that, getting involved in, in the people that work on the ground to, to determine why things went wrong and how to improve them. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Emil. Thanks for joining us. And uh, for those of you who are attending the webinar, after those two introductions, you know why I call them the big guns. And so let's uh, let's jump right into some questions. Uh, Vidya, I'd like to ask you, why has Cooper consistently maintained its position in the top right quadrant of Gartner's Magic Quadrant for seven consecutive years? Pretty impressive. Yes, that is impressive indeed. So when you talk about Gartner and any of their magic quadrants, they look at a couple of things, right? They look at uh, the the vendors in that particular market. They look at the completeness of the vision and then the ability to execute that particular vision or that particular product, if you will. Now, as you all know, Cooper has a very strong product offering. So we not only do procurement, invoicing, expenses, supply management, all of those good things, but we also do things like supply chain. We do, you know, pay and we continuously innovate on these products, right? We keep introducing new features, new functionalities. In a year, there are at least three releases that we make that meet the current market demands. And we try and stay ahead of our competitors by doing this. We keep adapting and, you know, all of those good things that uh, uh, anyone would expect a market leader to do. But in doing so, we make sure that our customers are satisfied. We have a track record of customer satisfaction of renewals, the positive feedback that we get from uh, our customers time on time, year after year, kind of plays a crucial role for us in order to maintain that quadrant uh, piece. And needless to say, we have the market presence and growth to back it up. But really, why have we stayed there for seven years? It can't just be because we are selling well and customers like us, right? Why do customers like us? And I think that comes down to three uh, three key things. So the first one is that user-friendly sort of experience that Cooper offers. We call it an Amazon-like interface. It's very intuitive, very streamlined. It's as easy as ordering, for example, something at home on your device on Amazon. And you can pretty much do the same thing from a business spend perspective using your Cooper app. We have automated more or less uh, most parts of the process that could be. We have an outstanding performance that we measure using key performance indicators. And we've, you know, we, we see that our clients uh, achieve outstanding performance or outstanding results on these KPIs time after time. And automation is a big piece of that. We then have something called a Cooper community. So this provides a very unique advantage, right? Like what it really does is take all that billions of dollars of worth of transaction and provides that anonymized intelligence for me, for example, who's sitting in a corner of the world, let's say raising purchase orders on a particular category, I can get prescriptive insights across that category across those suppliers, different dimensions, really, item cost analysis, supplier risk, and a bunch of other things, and reach out to people who I would not have had the opportunity to do before. And this, I think, is why Cooper has remained and will continue to remain in the top right of the magic quadrant of Gartner. 
Mm, yeah, it's very, very good video. I, I think that community re really is like a superpower, is an incredible, incredible thing. Um, so thank you for that. So uh, Cooper can't be customized, which sounds surprising considering your position as an industry leader in the BSM space. But I think there's more under the hood that meets the eye. Why can it not be customized? Well, uh, when you say it can't be customized, so here's the thing. The beauty of Coupa is it was built on that single line of code. So we have a multi-tenant software that's built on this one single line of code. What that means for layman is technically whether I work in sourcing or whether I work in pay or whether I work in contracting. It's that single user interface that I see and I can perform all those tasks on that single interface. Now, the reason why we don't call it customization is Basically, if it's a single line of code, there's only so much you can do. But what we do offer is an extremely configurable platform. And that's where partners such as Supply Chain Partner kind of comes in handy in terms of the work that they have done with customers and not only being able to configure a said module, but also being able to guide the client in terms of, is that re really necessary? Is that really what you would like to do? Let's look at not only your business requirements, but sort of your business objectives as well. And then see what is it that the platform has to offer in terms of extension to sort of make that happen for you. We also have a bunch of marketplace uh, suppliers who will then enable some of those things for you. For example, if you have to then work with an ERP and sort of, you know, integrate, those are options that we make available to you. So, yes, it is true that we are we don't necessarily use Coupa for customization, but then the configuration, the flexibility that we provide in that configuration allows organizations to tailor this platform, if you will, to their specific business processes. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great explanation, Vidya, it, because it, like, it kind of initially seems like configuration presents constraints. But if you look, look at the long term, the way that updates are evergreen, meaning that all Cooper customers benefit from updates. Uh, the fact that customers are not tied to the SI in terms of consulting and development, the fact that there are panel apps with the app store growing, this actually results in, uh, in less pain going forward. So, yeah, thank you for that. That's a great explanation. Um, Emil, if I can call on you. Are you there? There we go. There we go. But yeah. So um, is it possible to configure Cooper particularly well or conversely badly, for example, to recreate a poor business process in Cooper rather than using the opportunity to improve it? Um, so I'd say uh, let, let's uh, call it you can implement Cooper or you can implement Cooper really well. But, but yeah, there's definitely a, you can there's different um, you know, say leagues of implementation. So let's maybe if I use a sports analogy to try and explain this, this scenario. So looking for Coupa and sourcing Coupa and then procuring procuring it, you can typically compare it to a sports team um, sourcing all their players and getting all the people with the right skills into a, a, a team or a group, or rather say group. Um, but then the next step, and this is where the implementation plays a role, is to you, for you to now take all these different players with their skills and to, to get them to play as a team for the same goal and to use all the attributes in the best way possible in combination in a game plan that, that makes the team more effective than the individual. So that, that is where, where the Cooper implementation comes in um, to make sure that you get the most value out of the, the Cooper subscription that you have procured. Let's say, in, in my opinion, two or three main, shall I say, Focus areas are very well implemented the Cooper um, system. So the first one is uh, setting correct goals. The second one is having a clear and right focus on the on key elements in the different activity streams that you have during an implementation. And then the last um, uh, focus area should be planning for living with Cooper post your implementations. Uh, it's a great point, although. Uh, industry benchmarks are an amazing way to see how you're doing compared to your counterparts. The key here is to have a clear, compelling why, right? Or goals and objectives and ensure that you've executed the implementation in a way that achieves these goals and objectives. Speaking of goals, how do we get goal setting right pre-implementation? 
Sure. So I think um, there's a couple of things around that. Number one is, is to realize that the challenges that, that drove a company to source a, an application like Cooper um, are normally not only system-related challenges. It's often business-related challenges. And so when you set your goals, you need to keep in mind that you should not set project goals to be purely project-related, but rather procurement-related. To give a quick example, if you look at a project goal, it could be the typical things to stay within your budget and, and on time, um, maybe user adoption to the system, those kind of things. But a procurement goal would be that I need to reduce the approval time that it, um, on, my, on my purchase requisitions, and I need to be, have more spend visibility, and I need to have less deviations from my control mechanisms, et cetera which is how uh, it's a goal that, that kind of looks at wider areas than just the Cooper, but Cooper will be a key enabler to, to um, enable those goals and to make sure that you achieve those goals. Second thing is that goals should be a realistic and achievable. So what often happens is when, when a company goes out and they source a solution like Cooper, um, everyone's very eager and they wanna to get to best practice and being the best in the world in procurement. But depending on your maturity, Sometimes setting goals based on best practice research can be dangerous because those goals can be so far away from where you're currently at that it's unachievable. And that becomes demoralizing and, and, and makes it very difficult for you to get to a project that you can call a success. So goal setting should be seen as um, something that you can change over time. Um, so start with goals as part of your roadmap to take step one to grow towards where you want to end up eventually. And I'm trying to get there with one big step. And then the last thing around goals that I, that I think is, is quite helpful is that you need to remember to prioritize them. So in an ideal world, you can set goals and try and achieve all of them. But we know that the real world scenarios mean that often there's some compromise. Things change throughout a project. Priorities change, those kind of things. And prioritizing goals allow you to, in the scenarios where you have to compromise, make a decision as to which goals are non-negotiable and which goals you can either delay to a later stage or um, just get rid of to start off with um, and still be able to then look at your implementation as a, as a success. Mm. Yeah, yeah, very good. Real, setting realistic goals, I think, uh, will resonate with a lot of folks. Uh, and if we don't know where we're going, we're definitely going to get there. And so... <laughs> sure. I, Okay, so goals have been set. What's next in order to ensure a good implementation? Okay, so um, normally the goal setting portion will run in parallel with you sourcing Cooper. So typically after that point, you're going to get to the stage where your implementation will now happen. So during an implementation, um, there's quite a few um, activity streams like I mentioned before. And I'll just quickly touch on the things that you should focus on in each of those streams to to promote a very well um, implemented Cooper solution. So the first thing to look at is process optimization. So on a high level process optimization, sounds like an easy concept. I look at my processes and see where I can make a couple of improvements um, and Bob's your uncle. But it's also very easy to get process optimization wrong. So there's a couple of things that pose a danger. The first thing is that oftentimes organizations will try and just take their current processes and way of working and put it into a new system like Cooper and then assume that now I've, or it's basically, it makes it easier then because then I don't have to really change the way I'm doing things with the assumption that because I've got Cooper, it'll just somehow now um, be a, a better experience. Um, so that is that is one of the big pitfalls, I would say from, from a process optimization point of view. So you need to look at really evaluating your processes and questioning why you're doing things the way you're doing things. The second thing is chasing um, the, the goal of implementing every single functionality that Cooper offers. So there's a lot of things that Cooper can do, but not all of them are necessarily applicable to your business process. So you should not be designing to try and use every battle whistle that's available in Cooper, but rather use the ones that are applicable to you in an optimal way. So I think the kind of the last two key things are from a process optimization point of view is to focus on simplification. Simplifying a process means that the users find it easier to use the system. And as a result, chances of them using it correctly is, grows exponentially. And then the last thing is to remember and keep focus on the goals that you've set. So your processes 
need to be designed to op or to enable you to achieve those procurement goals that you said. Okay, that's um, then moving on to design of a holistic uh, process view. That is talking about the fact that Cooper will, in most cases, integrate to at least one ERP, and in most cases, will integrate to quite a few systems once um, once the implementation has been completed. And so, when you look at design, you can't just look at Cooper in isolation. You should look at a solution that spans all the systems that are involved, so that you end up with one holistic process that works from start to finish, and not um, the, the various systems um, designed in isolation with only their functionality taken into account. Third thing to get right um, is to get the right people in your in your room when you're doing design. So that is often also something that, that is easy to get wrong. Um, but there's a, there's a couple of what's well, an interesting combination of people that you should have in the room. Number one is you should have a couple of people that know how operations work on the ground every single day, how procurement is done, not just based on the processes that are documented that you have in your official SharePoint folder that says this is how we should do things, but how things happen on a daily basis. Because um, that's where, where you get deviations based on the fact that there are some process inefficiencies. The second group of people that you should have in, in your room when you design it are people that, that have the authority to make decisions promptly and right then, then and there. So the thing with decision making when it gets to design and, and, and optimization and change is that if you can make the decision relatively quickly, those changes get implemented and accepted. But the longer it takes and the more uh, committees you have to get the decision through and, and um, repeat kind of discussions on motivation for these changes, the higher the likelihood that you will just fall back to the processes that you are used to, that you are currently using, and end up with those in your Kube environment. Then number four would be to focus on um, content enablement and to give that enough priority. So when we talk about content enablement, the, that is comprised out of two things. The first one is data quality. The data quality um, will typically look at things like supply email addresses, having the right approvers in the right places, um, those type of things. And, and data quality kind of drives automation. So because most automations or decisions around how things get automated will be driven by a certain values and certain fields in your Cooper environment. And as a result, if your quality is bad, then it basically ruins your, your capability to automate certain processes. And there's a, it automatically brings in a lot of manual interventions that now have to take place to move process on to the next step. The second um, element to content enablement is basically looking at all the Cooper mechanisms that users can um, utilize to search for an item or service that they want to buy and to then make sure that they can easily select the right item or service at the right price from the right supplier and get that through the procurement process um, without any hassles and get whatever they were sourcing for. There are various mechanisms that, mechanisms that Cooper have um, and it's, it's worthwhile spending a lot of time to define when you use which mechanism and to make it as easy as possible for the users to then um, use these mechanisms. Then the first thing, our fifth focus area is looking at spend visibility and then more specifically planning ahead for spend visibility. So when we talk about spend visibility, this is typically also called reporting or analytics. And, and it's often something that gets left to the last um, area or the, as, as the last activity in a project implementation, because you're just building reports right on, on the things you've just implemented. So although building the actual reports and the analytics um, at the law or in the last um, stages of a, of a project is, is not necessarily wrong and it makes sense because then you've got data going through your system that you can analyze. It's important to keep in mind that you have to plan for what you want to analyze during your design phases already. And the reason for this is that if you want to analyze by certain dimensions or by certain views, um, to use a simple example, if you want to analyze spend by uh, certain industry or certain commodities that you have or certain regions that you have, it's important that these dimensions are captured or there's a container for these dimensions in your transactions and it gets captured during transaction or transactional operation. Otherwise, you would not have this data available to report on in the end. And then I think the last thing to look at from an implementation point of view would be to make sure that you focus enough on change and system adoption. So although this is almost often seen as a, a peripheral service to or a peripheral stream on, on a project, 
because it's not got direct or it's not got a direct impact on the actual system itself and the functional configuration. It is very important to make sure that all your stakeholders are on board from the start to the finish of the system. Because if you don't have users using the system, doesn't matter how great that system is, it's not going to deliver much value. And this uh, is normally done by your change management team. But I think it's also important to note that every project team member that would engage with any form of stakeholder during the project has a responsibility to you know, implement or to, to contribute to change management, and making sure that your engagements are positive and that you're promoting the changes that, that are coming forward as, as something that, even though it might be some discomfort in the short term, um, will be delivering a lot of value going down the line. Yeah. Yeah, so good, Emil. Uh, we, we can kind of get stars in our eyes, right, at the start of an implementation and get ahead of ourselves. What I'm, yeah. what I'm hearing is if we, if we cross the T's and dot the I's and ensure that the foundation that we're building on is rock solid from the outset, we can have assurance that the, that the Cooper house, so to speak, will be secure. Now, having implemented Cooper, is that the end of the story or is there anything else? Are there other considerations to be aware of? There's always something more. So not quite the end yet. Um, but this kind of comes back to the, the first three main uh, elements I spoke about for, for ensuring that you have a very well implemented Coupa solution. The last point of that was thinking ahead of how you're going to live with Coupa post your implementation. So obviously, once the Coupa goes live, um, the first thing that you have to think about is that con content enablement, like we spoke about during implementation, will be a continuous activity. There will always be new suppliers being created. You would have to... Um, change approvers, update approvers, create new contracts, create new items and services, change the existing items and services based on, on how products and specifications change. So there's a lot of content that needs to be generated and maintained in Coupa. And you should plan ahead to make sure that you have people that, that's been assigned that role and that have capacity to make sure that that gets done very well. Because again, if a user can easily find what they want, um, in the system, they will use the system and they will buy. Um, the second thing is making sure that you've got a, a support um, desk, desk up and running. So that's a typical support desk, like you have with any application, people logging tickets so because they, they can't find what they're looking for or they, for some other reason, they can't uh, place a purchase order or they've forgotten their password, whatever the case might be. And although those are normal almost, shall I say, operational activities day to day, it is still very important that, that all those tickets get handled very efficiently because it contributes again to your user experience and the perception of Coupa. And then the last thing that you need to cater for from a living with Coupa post implementation point of view is continuous improvement. So Coupa, once it's gone live, that's not the end of the road, it's now a living system. And it means that as you like you like your company changes over time and, and you have different goals and environment changes that you need to cater for and better ways of doing things. Um, that in that same manner, Coupa needs to change to, to basically adopt or adapt to, to your business environment and, and to keep um, in sync with it so that it just remains valuable for you to use. Um, together with that also, Coupa brings out releases um, three times a year, or big releases three times a year that gives you a whole bunch of new functionality three times a year that you can look at implementing to enhance the way you're doing things. And I think the, the, the thing that companies need to look out for is putting these three things in place often takes more effort and time than you might think. So because it might involve you having to generate more capacity by appointing new people and changing your operating model, your procurement operating model, so that it caters for these different things. Um, and, and then also training certain users in a different way of thinking and working with a system that's in procurement that, that are not currently doing that. So there's a lot of things that, um, and time that goes into making sure that you are ready to um, manage your group environment post the implementation of the issue. And so that shouldn't be left to the last stages of your project to now try and cater for that. Mm. Yeah, very good, Emil. Thank you so much uh, uh, for your insights there. I feel a bit like I've been drinking from a fire hose. Thank you very much. Sure. So, um, so in summary, uh, a successful implementation will leave the organization with three things. 
if I had to play this back. Number one, a system designed to support the organization's procurement goals or objectives. Uh, number two, a stable solution made up of multiple integrated systems with high user and supplier adoption rate, very important, with time spent at the inception of the implementation, ensuring that the right people are involved, the processes are efficient, spend visibility and reporting has been planned for, and enough time and effort has been allocated to change management, ensuring adoption. And then number three, an established support model that allows the system to evolve with the business as it grows. And then also it ensures that the user or supply experience remains a positive one. Post-implementation, please don't give me marks for my summary. That's what I, that's what I heard. Well, we, could have, we could have just done my whole section in, in two minutes if you, if you said this to start off with. <laughs> hey, we, we needed that's a to good summary. Wonderful. Emil, thank you so much. And, and Vidya, thank you so much. We got a couple of questions from the floor. And so I'm going to read them out, put you guys on the spot. Here we go. Vidya, I'm going to ask you to lead this one. How do we tell if we've been successful, not just in terms of our goals, but compared to other companies? Oh, that's a very good question. So it, look, it's important to sort of set your goals before you implement and sort of measure them, right? And Coupa as a company provides you several ways to do it. So the first one is that we publish something called a benchmark report, which gives you that sort of insight into critical KPIs, if you will, for your digital transformation initiative. It gives you that data that's based on uh, it's anonymized, it's aggregated from more than 3,000 companies uh, going over $4 trillion in spend and counting as we speak. It covers, uh, I'm going to say, at least 20 categories of KPIs across procurement, invoicing, expenses, payments, ESGs, you know, brilliant things like supplier risk. You can download this now on our website, by the way. I'll give you a view of how the world's best run sort of organization, deliver profitability, deliver performance, deliver their uh, purpose. And as someone who's newly implemented Coupa, you can then look at how do I improve my profitability? How do I improve? Uh, how do I address my risk or compliance? You know, those sort of things. How do I optimize my cash? How do I operate more efficiently? And all of those good things. So that's absolutely available to you via the benchmark report. There are several best practices that we make available to you, right? You can get into our community today as a Cooper customer and talk to multiple people who have been on this journey, understand what is it that they do and learn and adapt as you go along your journey. And absolutely one of the best things to do would be to work with, you know, for example, SAP, and they can walk you through at the beginning of an implementation, what does success metrics look for you? through the implementation and also post-implementation, what is it that you need to do to continue growing as well? Maybe just even to add to what Vidya said, another yes. interesting thing that Coupa's got, once you're up and running, it's got, because it's using the community data, it can give you prescriptions, it can give you comparisons inside of Coupa that tells you how you compare to other organizations in the same type of industry than you are when it gets to efficiency and, and managing spend and those kind of things. So mm. even, even inside of the tool set, you can compare it to, to the rest of your community. Emil, you've talked about how to get it right. What are the main challenges that companies face or problems they experience that make them get it wrong? Um, I think so, so that make them get it wrong is typically having the, the wrong people in, in meetings um, or having the wrong people in design sessions. And then also not having strong sponsorship and someone that focuses on the initial goals and all the things that we talked about um, a little bit earlier. Because if you don't have someone that focuses on those things and, and continuously pulls the project back towards what you are aiming to achieve, people do get into um, a lot of the details and they get lost in the details. And the moment you get lost in details, it means that you will most likely revert back to the easiest way to do things, which is the way you currently know. Um, and then you end up with bad adoption, so users don't like your system, um, you have unhappy suppliers, and a combination of those two is dangerous because they will find ways to now work around your system and not use it, because that's an easier way to go forward. And that means it renders your Cooper environment a lot less valuable than it could be um, if, you, if you had the implementation of successful. Um, it also limits your automation if you, the moment you start finding workarounds. And then I think the last 
important thing that also often gets <laughs> forgotten is integration issues. So if you don't look at a holistic design, you spend a lot of time on that integration failures and, and, and a lot of trouble with integrations mean that people also start avoiding systems because once I do something in one system, I can't complete this process because it hasn't arrived successfully in the other system. And that poor support is that you've set up will never have enough people to try and resolve this in time. Samil, uh, Vidya, Cooper yeah. has all sorts of modules. Are they all implemented in the same way? Oh, some really great questions coming through today. This is my favorite part of the webinar. Um, so in terms of implementation, if you look at our framework, regardless of where you're implementing Coupa in the world or what module are implementing, that framework remains the same, right? We're first setting you up for success in terms of looking at your metrics and what have you, doing those workshops, discovery, all of the good things. And then we start to design, configure the system, integrate it, test it, deploy it, and then move into hypercase. So that framework sort of remains the same. However, what changes when you look at the modules is what are you implementing that module for and making sure that the configurations are tailored to that particular functionality. So for example, if you're implementing Coupa P2P, so make sure that the catalogs are set up, the approval workflows are set up, the payment options are set up, and you know, you're integrating with suppliers, all of those good things. Whereas if you're implementing expenses, we, then we're making sure that the policies are in place, the reimbursement workflows are in place, uh, expense categories are there, they are well-defined with the tax structure and all of those good things, right? So that differs. Then what differs would be the data integration and migration, if you will. So for example, if you're implementing our contracts module and you were using a repository of contracts before. So how do we sort of migrate all of that, bring that in and make sure that we're not only bringing it into, into Cooper, but we are able to work with it. So defining that would differ in an implementation process. And last but not the least, and Emil touched upon this very nicely, is the user and supplier adoption, right? Because your system is as successful as the users and suppliers who adopt it. For the suppliers, we make it very easy. We give them multiple ways to sort of communicate with us. But with the users, you have to make sure that the end user training that you provide is kind of tailored to the role that they perform. So an approver would not need the kind of training that a person who's actually raising those requisitions would. And if they don't know what to do, like Emil said, they'll just go back to the old ways, not fill information in. And that beats the purpose of having the whole system in the first place. Yeah, great. Thank you, Vidya. Uh, Emil, for you, yeah. since lockdown, uh, how much time of an implementation is on site and how much can be done remotely? Okay. Yeah. So um, I think we've done uh, both of them. So especially since from the COVID point of view, we've implemented quite a few big projects completely remotely. Um, and before that, we've done a lot of projects where we were completely on site. So it's, you, you can make a success of both of them, but I think from my point of view, and from that's kind of SCP's view on it, is that a hybrid works best. Uh, you would not necessarily want to have all your resources on site the whole time, because that makes things more expensive for a customer. But during design, especially, then, you, then it's just, it's better to have a face-to-face -face interaction with the customer if possible. It allows you to draw on a whiteboard and it makes it, an interactive engagement. Otherwise, you tend to, to lose attention of, of some of the key role players. And it's very difficult to monitor that monitor that on, on a remote session. Um, but then, you know, so, so there's kind of design and then looking at testing and then on, during go live. So the, the day after you've gone live, your users, well, the users normally really appreciate if there's someone on site they can walk to and they can, they can shout about something that doesn't work and they feel that like they're getting kind of personal attention rather than having to wait for a team's call to get on for, for a limited amount of time, that kind of thing. So I, I'd say that's what we, we try and do. We, we try and be on site during design. And then when we do the UA, UAT or user acceptance testing, and then during hyperkey. But for the rest um, of the project implementation, we will, we will do that remotely. And you also don't have to have your whole team on site. You can have the key people interfacing with the customer on site with your backend configuration engine setting off sites for and doing some of the work in the background. background. Great guys, that's the end of the question and uh, question time. And we've come to the end of our time together. Just for all of you attending, just wanna thank you so much for attending. Uh, it certainly would have sucked if we presented to each other, so you made it worthwhile. <laughs> and uh, 
you'll, as I mentioned before, you'll have a PDF of our white paper re related specifically to this webinar topic in your inbox in the next 24 hours or so at the very latest. And in fact, the, the Cooper benchmark report that Vidya was mentioning in one of her answers, I think there's a link to that in that PDF. So lots of good stuff for you to read through. Uh, I also want to thank Vidya. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, Emil, you as well. Thank you. Rich, Richard, for, for putting this together. Uh, Sean, who you haven't seen, but he's, uh, he's been running the show behind the scenes. Thank you, Sean. And uh, with that, I bid you adieu. Take care. Keep well. Bye, everyone. Thank you.